Okay, okay, I'll go to Australia. I'll take a vacation if that's what you all want. Well, that's great, Dad. Forget international rescue for a while. I'll help my father to pack your bags, Mr. Tracy. The first problem is, who's going to take your place, Dad? Well, that's got to be you, Scott. You're the eldest. Well, that's swell of you guys to put me in the hot seat. But my job is flying Thunderbird 1. Now, hold on, boys. I'm still giving the orders around here. I'm not gone yet, you know. Scott, you're next in line, so you'll have my place. Virgil will remain in charge of Thunderbird 2. And Gordon, Thunderbird 4. That only leaves you, Alan. But John's only just begun his term of duty in the space station. You mean I've got to handle Thunderbird 1? Well, it's the obvious choice. Only rarely do we have to use Thunderbirds 1 and 3 on the same operation. You will control whichever craft is required. Yeah, that figures, Alan. You're used to high speed. Guess you take over my old job. Well, that's settled then. I'll just check things with John. <laughs> International rescue from Thunderbird 5. What's new, Father? Annie has persuaded me to join her in Australia for a short vacation. Gee, that's great, Dad. I figure it's about time you had a rest. Yeah. Hmm. Well, before I hand over to Scott, I want to know if everything's okay. Oh, nothing much uh, happening to concern us, Father. Uh, just the World Navy are on an exercise in the Atlantic. <laughs> Prepare to commence gyropedo explosive tests. Aye, aye, sir. Target vessel moving to area red. Good. If these new weapons are successful, they'll revolutionize undersea firepower. Yes, sir. No more negative cat and mouse games. Our vessels will be able to attack fast and with power. Right. Put Atom Sub Reaper on standby. Uh, she's adopting combat position now, sir. 100 miles from target vessel. On course and steady, sir. Okay, Lieutenant. Dive. Opening two, four, and six, sir. Alert all vessels in vicinity and warn the drilling rig seascape. The seascape drilling rig from World Navy flagship Atlantic. Please acknowledge. The seascape here, Atlantic. Receiving you five by five. Uh, we are about to commence target practice. There could be a number of nuclear explosions. Put there now. Here, Dick, I'll take over. Hello. Atlantic, this is Frank Hooper, rig superintendent here. I don't like the sound of what you just said. All the explosions will be beneath the surface. Out of the 40 rigs in the area, yours is the nearest. There's absolutely no chance of any danger. I hope you're right. Ending transmission. Our Navy, always belly aching about the number of new rigs going up. But no one's allowed to complain about their explosions. Gyropedos, one and two at ready, sir. Right. Approaching radio control target vessel. Bearing seven, five, eight. Contact. Wayboat, seek and destroy. Number one is moving off course, sir. Second strike negative. Kill it, Captain. You heard the commander, Lieutenant. Destroy by remote. I can, sir. No response. She's a maverick.
Oh. Thunderbird 5 from International Rescue Base. Come in, John. Base from Thunderbird 5. What's up, Scott? Oh, nothing, John. Just wondering how things were with you. Well, oh, it's all quiet here. How about that atomic explosion in the Atlantic? No problems there. The seas calmed down. Guess the guys on that rig are glad about that. Well, Kovitz, the swell settled. Imagine those Navy guys letting a fool thing like that happen. It's bad enough being stuck out here in the middle of the Atlantic without the Navy trying to send us under. Say, the weather computers are reacting. You reckon there'll be a lulu of a gale blowing come sunup? Aboard Seascape, Cooper and Kravitz began their all-night vigil. Whilst back at base, after Dad had left to begin his vacation, Scott was thoughtfully contemplating his first day in command of operations. All was peaceful on the island, but not far from the drilling rig, at the site of the gyropedo explosion, changes were taking place on the ocean bed. A deep fissure was forming. Then suddenly... That. It's about the same position as that atom explosion. Sound the alarms. Attention all stations. Go ahead, John. What's happening? Looks as though that atomic explosion caused more damage than was first thought. How's that? Superintendent Hooper on the seascape has sent out an alarm call. There's a 200-foot jet of fire blazing up 30 miles from the rig. Are the guys in the seascape in danger? Not certain yet, Scott. Well, you'd better get in contact. Okay. Drilling rig seascape from International Rescue. Do you read me? Come in, seascape. International Rescue. You heard about this fire jet, huh? Yes. What are the dangers? The way I figure it. That atomic explosion fractured the seabed. The heat somehow has taken a few hours to penetrate through to the gas field below the ocean floor. What is the extent of the field? This particular gas pocket stretches 40 miles west of Seascape's position. How real and urgent is the danger? It's hard to estimate, Scott. There could be an explosion causing a massive tidal wave spreading to both coasts of the Atlantic. Yeah, well, that's a pretty terrifying thought. The question is, do we get involved or not? And that's entirely up to you, Scott. You're in command. Yeah. Well, I wonder what Dad would do. <laughs> Interrupt this broadcast for a news flash. Reports are coming in that a gas field in the Atlantic has been penetrated, and a fire jet over 200 feet high is threatening shipping and drilling rigs in the area. The cause of the fire jet has not been firmly established, but it is believed to be connected with an atomic explosion during World Navy maneuvers. And now, back to your music program. Shall I wait, Mr. Tracy? You dare, Parker. Mr. Tracy has come here to get away from those kind of problems. It's okay, Parker. I heard the newscast. Jeff, I thought you were asleep. No, Penny, but you can relax. I'm not worried about that fire jet. No one has been hurt. Scott will keep a check on the situation. He'll realize that this is not a job for international rescue. Brains, call the boys. This is a job for international rescue. Thunderbirds... I go. A column of fire presented quite a problem, but fortunately, one that we were very well equipped for. You see, Brains had anticipated such an emergency, and he had constructed an underwater sealing device. 
that could be maneuvered over the gas outlet with the aid of Thunderbird 4. And firmly anchored by means of firing high tensile harpoons into the seabed. Then it was only a simple matter to seal up the valve and the flame was capped. Within a short space of time, this whole operation was over and we were all back at base congratulating ourselves. <laughs> Well, folks, we did it. Yes, Scott, you were great. No panic. You didn't put a foot wrong. Virgil's right. Guess Dad had better watch out. You could do him out of a job. Scott, this is your father. Oh, hi, Dad. How are you? I just heard the newscast. International Rescue kept that fire jet in the Atlantic. Sure we did, Dad. And we were successful. That's got nothing to do with it. You should never have got involved. Well, listen, Father... No, you listen, son. International Rescue is not just a lot of machinery for putting out fires. It's a serious business. But that fire could have caused a disaster. We're not dealing with chances, Scott. We can't afford to make mistakes. Well, how about that? Yeah, tough, Scott. I guess to Dad, you made the wrong decision. But for my money, I figure you were right. column. Get international rescue fast, O'Shea. Oh, we didn't get their frequency. Just make the call on any wavelength. They'll pick it up. Go ahead, John. That gas field has blown again. You mean the ceiling device didn't work? It worked fine, Scott. This is another fire jet five miles east of the last one. Well, what gives, Rains? Uh, well, uh, the first explosion must have moved some unstable rock producing pockets of oxymetrogen in its cavities. And these have been ignited by the fire uh, under the seabed. Well, then why hasn't the whole gas field gone up like you said earlier? Well, it's hard to be conclusive, Alan, but I would say the flame is traveling until it finds the next weakest point. That point could well be seascape. Then what are we waiting for? Now, hold on, Virgil. As I see it, this is not a job for international rescue. Boy! Have you changed in the last couple of hours? Well, sure I changed. Two hours ago, Dad hadn't given me a bawling out. Well, I'm not going to do it again. No, sir, it's my decision, and I figure normal methods of rescue are adequate. Call from the Atlantic, Frank. International rescue is not coming. The Navy is going to airlift us off the rig. What about the gas? Guess it's just left to burn. Columns have slipped its shackles. Come on, you know what we have to do. Yeah. Check the extent of the damage. That's it. And we better take a look at the other supports. Looks like a couple of others are slipping too. Base from Thunderbird 5. The seascape's in trouble, Scott. A support column slipped. The fire's moving much faster than we thought. It's found an outlet close to the rig. Well, what are they doing about it? Hooper and O'Shea are going down on a diving sphere. Look serious, Dick. I can see at least six shackle bolts here at the base. Yeah. Maybe we could fix it. Get our scuba diving gear and renew the bolts. I, I guess so. Oh, what happened? The rig slipped again, and the sphere wind systems were severed. We're trapped down here. Our only hope 
is that the control center have registered our position. Base from Thunderbird 5. We've got a real emergency on our hands now, Scott. Those two guys are trapped in the diving sphere at the bottom of the rig. The drilling rig is obviously the next weakest point. The fire will certainly use the borehole as an outlet. Okay, boys. This is really it. International rescue is the only hope for those guys. Alan, get Thunderbird 1 out to Seascape. Yes, sir. Thunderbirds 2 and 4 will be needed to get Hooper and O'Shea to the surface before the rig blows. Now get going, boys, and fast. <laughs> Give me some more coffee, Tim Tim. Yes, Virgil. Are you at the danger zone yet? Yes, Scott. I'm about to drop the pot. Well, tell Gordon he's got to work fast. That fire may hit that borehole any time. Look, Hooper. Let's face it. They're never going to get us out. Not with all that metal on top of us. Oh, take it easy, boy. Take it easy. How's it look down there, Gordon? Pretty bad, Virgil. But I'm going in closer. Okay, Gordon. Navy Hella Jets are getting the rig crew off. Mobile control from Thunderbird 4. The pressure and the damage has jammed the sphere hatch. What's the action then, Gordon? Well, I'll have to cut through the guide cables holding the sphere to the support column. Okay. I'll tell base. I felt movement then. The rig's slipping some more. Alan, can you hear me? Mobile control, come in. Okay, Scott. We're all right. But I'm worried about Thunderbird 1. Yeah. She could slip off that platform. How many more crew to airlift off that rig? Six, Scott. Right. Well, the Navy will fix them. You get your gear into Thunderbird 1, and you operate from the air. FAB. Alan, Thunderbird 1 is sliding. Get her up. Fast. <laughs> from Thunderbird 1. Clear of rig. We'll remain on hover in danger zone. FAB. Thunderbird 1 from Thunderbird 4. Cables are free. I'm going in to shift the rest of the debris. FAB. I moved in to begin shifting the debris from the sphere by means of the rams in the nose of Thunderbird 4. But as fast as I worked, so more wreckage continued to fall. Thunderbird 1 from Thunderbird 4, what's happened to the rig? This wreckage will smash the craft to pieces. The seascape's breaking up, Gordon. How long will you be? I'll let you know when I've cleared the mess away. I've cleared most of the junk. I'm going to try to haul the sphere free with the electromagnets. FAB. At the flick of a switch, I replaced the rams with two powerful magnets. Then I moved back in to attempt to lift. What are they playing at? They'll bust this baby wide open. They're, they're not going to make it in time. They're too late. Alan, turbulence near the rig. Thunderbird 1 to Helijet. Get that last man off the rig fast. Virgil, get clear. What about Gordon? Thunderbird 4, the rig's gonna blow. Move fast. But with a sphere attached, it was impossible to move fast. The weight on the nose of Thunderbird 4 made steering extremely difficult. It seemed an age before we began moving away from the wreckage. I didn't think we'd make it. Above us, the stricken rig was racked by explosions. She was aflame from end to end. Slowly, as one by one the support columns buckled or were destroyed by a blast, she began to settle lower in the water. Until, finally, she slid slowly from sight beneath the turbulent waves.
Gordon, are you okay? Just about, Virgil. The sphere's safely in tow. Will you make ready with a grab? Sure thing, Gordon. You bring the sphere to the surface, and then I'll take it back to the carrier. FAB, Virgil. Surfacing now. International Rescue saved us. Yeah, I figured we were dead for sure. And so another successful mission was completed. After Virgil had landed the sphere on the flagship Atlantic, he returned for me, and we made our way back to base. I, I guess the strain of listening to the radio bulletins of our progress was too much for Dad, because he arrived home just shortly after we did. But this time, full of praise for the way Scott had handled the situation. So long for now. Thank you, Parker. Will you pour? I'll have two lumps today. Very well, my lady. Oh, uh, here's the paper. Headlines are quite interesting. Dear me, the home of Lord and Lady Donington Brown was robbed last night. They live just up the road from here, don't they, my lady? Yes. Oh, it's really quite frightening. This is the twelfth robbery of stately homes inside a month. Seems to me the geezer what's doing it knows what he's about, too. He only pinches the family heirlooms. The newspapers reckon they're priceless. Oh, they are, Parker. But why doesn't the thief take cash? He leaves contemporary works of art behind also. Search me, my lady. The coppers don't know nothing. Look there. It says, uh... Is out there baffled? So it does. It appears there are never any clues for them to work on, and no signs of a forced entry. Cool. If it was in the cat burglar business, I'd have given half me loot away to do a job like this, look. Uh, well, we won't go into your past activities now, Parker. Do you realize that we could be the next on the robber's list? Eh? Who are we? Oh, you wouldn't get back here. Oh, your treasures are stashed away in the vault. I know, Parker. But similar vaults in other hands didn't stop the thief. Somehow he manages to penetrate the strongest locks and break the most complicated combinations. Oh, yeah. He was forgetting that. Uh, and he manages to knock out the automatic TV cameras, too. Exactly. It's almost as if he's a phantom. Well... <laughs> Be the bloke who don't believe in ghosts. Ed says how we ought to protect ourselves. I knew you'd see it my way, Parker. So this is what we'll do. Forewarned is forearmed. You will contact your previous underworld associates and try to discover the identity of this villain. Oh, that's a, 
That's a good idea. A good food fingers Fred. He, he keeps his ear close to the ground. If anyone knows the geezer, fingers Fred will have heard. The teapot is leaking. Hello? International Rescue here. Lady Penelope speaking. Hi, Penny. Jeff Tracy here. I heard a news flash on TV about these stately homes robberies. Yes, Jeff, it's all very worrying. Yeah. Well, it occurred to me that thief might choose your house next. Precisely. I was wondering if you'd like me to send brains across to England. She's got some pretty good gadgets that uh, maybe could improve your security. It's awfully sweet of you to offer, Jeff. But I really think I can handle things. Are you sure, Penny? You know, you've got some equipment in your house that many people would love to get their hands on. Oh, you mean the international rescue gadgets? Well, I don't think our robber's interested in new things, Jeff. He only deals in heirlooms. Okay, Penny, if you're happy. But remember, call me any time. Brains will be over there on the double. Thank you so much, Jeff. I'll remember. Goodbye. Ah, Parker, what did you find out? Nothing, belady. The Hunter World blokes are up in bed because they don't know who the robber is. They're as baffled as the law. What about the booty? Have any of the heirlooms been seen or heard of? Not a perished one. Fingers reckon this tea leaf is a crank collector. Not one of us at all. You mean one of them, don't you, Parker? Uh, yes, belady. Sorry for a moment, I got carried away. Talking of fingers brought back a lot of old memories. Uh, yes, quite so, Parker. But the fact remains, we have no further clue to the thief's identity. And my home is still unprotected from that man. It looks that way. What could we do? Absolutely no. So we'll go about our normal business and hope this mystery man spares us a visit. Right. Then I'll take the tea things to the kitchen. Thank you, Parker. When you're done, will you telephone with them? There's nothing like buying a bath fit of clothes to take one's mind off one's problems. Very well, Belady. Will you be staying in town for dinner? Why not? Yes, take in a show and dine out. Yes, that's an excellent idea. After you, Parker. Thank you, Belady. Miss, uh, it's Parker here. Uh, Lady Penelope would like to see some of your club at this afternoon. Certainly, Mr. Parker. We'll be all ready to have leadership. I have some simply marvelous new creation. Be careful with that tapping device, Dawkins. We don't want them to suspect we're listening to their conversation. Sorry, sir. I don't think they realize anything is amiss. It would appear, Mr. Charles, that Lady Penelope is traveling to London after lunch. Excellent. Keep listening, Dawkins, to make sure. But I think we can rely on her ladyship to make her trip worthwhile. She enjoys the theater and dinner in town. Now, Cynthia, darling, please stand still. I've got to get this gown absolutely perfect. Lady Penelope is very discerning about the creation she buys. You don't have to tell me, Miss Whitson. Last month, I modeled 27 dresses for her before she was satisfied. Yes, well, well, that's not for you to say, Cynthia. Her ladyship is one of my best customers and a very good friend. Nothing is too much trouble. Mm, I suppose you're right, Miss Whitson. When she arrives, any minute now. So, darling, please keep still. I will never be ready. Here we 
we are, belady. We kids. Thank you, Parker. Uh, there's no need for you to come in. I'll be meeting you around six o'clock. Very well, belady. I don't like hanging around ladies' shops anyway. So I understand, Parker. I'll see you at six then. Brighton Ward Mansion in five minutes, Mr. Charles. Right. Switch to silent flight and get the gas capsules with him. Yes, Mr. Charles. Bring her into a hover over the chimney's Dawkins. I'll release the capsule. Right. By the time we touch down on the lawn, the servants will be out cold. Did you enjoy the play, lady? Oh, yes, Parker. It was very good. And those beautiful gowns from Wickham. I can't wait to go to the Russian ambassador's ball. Yes. Missy Lane shows a nice bit of cloth, don't she? The best, Parker. Now, will you telephone the house, please? Lillian can prepare my nightcap. Right. Will you be wanting tea or cocoa? Oh, cocoa, I think, Parker. That's the phone, Mr. Charles. Yes, it could be Lady Penelope. We'd better get a move on. Help me with this vase. Very good, sir. Have you got all you want, sir? I think so. Let me check the list. Yes, it's all here. Come on. Seem to be no reply, Belady. How very strange. All the staff can't be asleep. Better put your foot down, Parker. Something must have happened. Parker, do you see what I see? Yes, Belady. It's an Ellie jet. It's just taken off from the front lawn. Exactly. And I'm not expecting visitors tonight. Parker, I do believe we've been robbed. Cool. Shall I shoot it down with the carriage, belady? Certainly not, Parker. The helijet could be a perfectly innocent caller. And on the other hand, if it is the stately hands robber, he'll have some of my most valuable vases and china aboard. We wouldn't want them to be smashed, would we? I suppose not, Pilate. But what are we going to do? Stop the car, Parker. Now, I put the suction microphone in my bag yesterday. Ah, yes. Here it is. A lonely your pneumatic machine pistol, Parker. Here you are, Pilate. It's got a compressed hair charge in it. Good. Now I just insert the microphone in the chamber, like so, and take careful aim. Good shooting, Belady. I'll switch on the receiver speaker. Good. The darkness will stop the occupants of that car identifying the helicopter. Yes, sir. But it was a close thing. Oh, I agree, Dawkins. I'm glad that was the last stick to home on my list. You mean we've got all the pieces? 
Jasper. All but one final collection, Dawkins. And you know where that is? Of course, Mr. Charles. But getting the crown jewels is a bit different from the heirlooms we've stolen so far. Different, Dawkins, different. But the most vital of them all. By this time tomorrow, my family's disgrace will be avenged. Switch off the receiver, Parker. I think we've heard enough. What's it all about, lady? I'm not exactly sure of the reasons behind the plot, but one thing is certain. This Mr. Charles has been working to a set plan, and that plan will be complete tomorrow when he steals the crown jewels. Cool. What an all that would be. Are you going to kill the coppers? I don't think so, Parker. You will find it hard to believe that crown jewels could be stolen, don't you? Oh, say I do. Then so will the authorities. No, Parker, no one would listen to us. We've got to act ourselves. Yeah, I suppose you're right. What do we do about it? Well, right now, we'll go home and get a good night's sleep. And tomorrow evening, we'll take a little trip to the Tower of London. <laughs> Grim-looking place, ain't it, lady? Yes, Parker. The tower has been the centre of many turbulent events. It used to be a prison in there. Oh, do we, uh, do we have to go in there? You know how I feel about them places. I'm afraid we do, Parker. That's if Mr. Charles keeps the plan we overheard him making last night. Look, lady, That's the safe energy. So it is, Parker. It would appear that Mr. Charles is going to oblige us with his presence. What's the fool, lady? We'll wait a while and give him time to get in. Now, Dawkins, we will come up against ten beef eaters. Are you ready for them? Perfectly, Mr. Charles. The gas capsules will take care of them. Right. Adjust your breathing mask and we'll be on our way. I'll get the locks, Dawkins. Watch out for guards. Hey, what do you think you're doing? You've got no right. Oh! Uh, oh. Uh, uh. Come on, Parker. I think we'll find Mr. Charles has opened the gates for us. Yeah. But I bet there's a few sleepy beef eaters about. Oh, I almost forgot my gas mask. Right, Parker. I'm ready. <laughs> Sack, Dawkins. Very soon now our task will be complete. And we can return to a normal way of life. Yes, Dawkins. But this was something that had to be done. I have avenged my family. Now I can rest. Where you are going, Mr. Charles, there'll be plenty of time for that rest. What? No, don't move. I don't like using guns. The bangs give me a headache. But I'll have to suffer if you don't do exactly as I say. You can't stop me now. I've completed the task that was set me all those centuries ago. Nothing can stop me now. A bullet can't bite. And her ladyship is a dead shot. 
Better behave yourself. Put the jewels back, Parker. Do I have to, my lad? I've never had my hands on so much loot in it all of my life. Parker. Oh, very well, belady. Here, give me that sack. I'm very interested to know why you carried out these robberies, Mr. Charles. By your standing, I wouldn't think greed or monetary gain was your motive. No, the actual things meant nothing to me. But to my long dead ancestors, the Granvilles, they were the symbols of power and wealth. You mean all these treasures you've stolen once belonged to your family? Yes. My people were once noble peers. They were stripped of all titles and property by Richard the Lionheart. Fascinating. But King Richard must have had good reason. They were convicted of cowardice during the Crusades, but it was all a mistake. My family could never have run away from a fight. The Lionheart was noted for being a just and kindly man. I really prefer his side of the story to yours. You're like all the rest. That's why I robbed you. The Tritons and the Wards were connected with Richard's decision. Oh, yes. I remember reading something about some property being distributed amongst the King's loyal friends. It's your back, Belady, and I've locked the cage again. Well done, Parker. Now, kindly handcuff our two friends to the grill. The police will be able to find them after we made a telephone call. You can't prove anything. They'll never be able to hold us. Oh, I think this tape recording of our conversation will be enough to make the police search for him. But, Belady, your voice is hard there. Your cover will be broken. No, Parker. This microphone is designed to record only male voices. Brain sent it to me. Something to do with the lower octave vocal cords. Ooh, that's clever. Uh, shall we go, then? I think so. Farewell, Mr. Charles. Your family would have been proud of you. They finished up in jail, too, I believe. <laughs> Brought your early morning tea, belady. And uh, here's the paper. Oh, look, Parker. The police have recovered all the stolen heirlooms. Oh, yes, belady. Uh, that bloke Charles spelt it off about you catching him, too. Really? What does it say the police made of that accusation? Oh, there it is, belady. The uh, fifth lad from the bottom. Hmm. Inspector Sedare of the Yard stated that he knew of Lady Penelope and no gentler or more charming person ever graced the earth. The inspector added that it was impossible to associate her ladyship with criminals in any way. Well, well, well. After compliments like that, I can see I'll have to buy two extra tickets for the policeman's ball. As long as you don't harsh beer log, belady. <laughs>